We have the pictures and the music. Thank you. I just, um, I just need to begin with a, a few uh, authorial credits. The music is by my friend Hans Joachim Rodelius, actually an Eno collaborator, and with my, with my brother George, who goes under the name of No One. The pictures um, are all taken by me, um, along with my team um, working in caves in the Orchard Dales National Park. I just mentioned John Thorpe, Gary Rushworth, Tom Lord. There is some other authorship involved here, but I want you to discover that. And um, what we're going to do is an experiment which is about making sense of, of things. And I've chosen stones. There are a lot of stones here uh, in front of me. And there are 43 stones. There are 43 slides. The slides are going to go round. You will see them more than, than once. And we're going to pass the stones around the audience. And I want you to move them around from one person to another, exchange them at about the same speed that the images are changing. Something like that. It's just in order for those 45 objects, 43 objects, to get around, around all of you. I don't want you to dwell on the objects. I want you to. I don't want you to think about them. I want you to feel them as you pass them from hand to hand. Obviously, you'll look at them, but don't, don't hold on to them and turn them over too much in your hands. Just feel them and, and pass them on. And some of them are sharp, so please be careful. Some of them are, are heavy. And if you relax as you pass them from one person to another, uh, you can feel the exchange and you can glance from your hands to the objects, to the pictures. Okay, could we start to hand these objects out and if we just pass them in sequences around the audience, it doesn't really matter, just pass them to people to then pass on, to pass through the audience and we'll slowly collect those back in again. Could you start to pass those on, along the audience now? If you can, do you mind starting to pass them? One, take one, pass it on, and then take another. If you hold the whole thing, and then you could just pass the stone to the next person, and so onwards until they all go out. Thank you. If I give you, if I put this on your lap, and you could pass them out to the person along here, and then along all the way through to the back. Thank you. I just have a few smaller objects here, which I'm going to pass out. Katinka. Can I pass that one to you? Can I pass you some objects here? Some objects to pass along. Can I pass you this object? Pass along. Pass you some objects. Here's some objects here. Do you have something to pass? Pass around. So there are now 43 stones which are passing among you. It's called the Tradescant's Ark Experiment, which I've, I've named it in honor of John Tradescant and John Tradescant, senior and junior, father and son, who were collectors of things in the 17th century. And they were the exhibitors of the world's first paper per view museum. They had a cabinet of curiosities known as Tradescant's Ark that was set up at Lambeth on the Thames. And much later, it was sold to Elias Ashmole and became the germ of the Ashmolean Museum.
Not much of it survives. There are little parts of it in the Ashmolean Museum. Um, what is more important is the intellectual move which they made in the catalogue which John Tradescant the Younger created in which he distinguished between two types of things, naturals and artificials, both spelt with double L's at the end. But he divided all of the things that he'd collected into things which he thought were natural and things which he thought had been modified by human hand, what as archaeologists we now call artifacts. So as you pass the objects, think about this, but don't pause, think about which you think are natural and which you think are artificial. Everything is natural in a way. They're all stones. But which ones have been modified? Perhaps you might say they've all been modified by me collecting them off the shelves of my house and office. And before that, they've been collected in other places. And I've, I've brought them here. But some of them were modified before me. So you can think about the processes. What were the processes that modified them? As they move around, there are, you can think about three processes. There are chemico-physical processes. You might call those geological. We need to move some more objects somewhere towards the front here. I don't know how these are moving through the audience, but we have, a, we have an, an object, uh, object poor zone of the audience at the front here, if we can manage that. There are biological processes, which have then been followed on by geological processes. And there are cultural processes. So you can see there's one sort of stone becoming another sort of stone. You can see sediments in layers. You can see conglomeration. You can see metamorphosis under pressure, magmatic cooling. There are some ores passing among you. And you can feel the indices of those processes in some of the things that are moving around in your hands. You can also see life becoming stone. You can see some of the spaces where living things were, which have been filled with mud, trapping the bodies, re-encasing things in a mineral womb, replacing delicate upward and downward pressures and the urge to twist and to slide and to locomote with stasis. So captured patterns becoming eventually non-biological again and slowly eroding to reveal a back catalog of growth. You can also see and feel stone becoming a part of life. The things that were found by us as we came to be, making it possible for us to be. There's technology passing around you, material culture, there are artifacts, seams of flint, eventually leading to our silicon world. There's chipping and grinding and polish. There's prehistoric debris passing among you. You can feel things, if you've had them in your hands, that were felt by Neanderthals, exactly the shapes and surface coolness of things made by Neanderthals exactly as they felt them. And there are also things passing among you that were felt by early Homo, earlier than Neanderthals. You can feel which ones they are if you know. So the processes are geological, and they're Darwinian, and they're archaeological. Those are three processes. The properties are uniformitarian, emergent, and designed. Let's not confuse those. Uniformitarian is geological, Darwinian is emergent, and archaeological is designed. It would be easy to be seduced by our own designs in this building, 
so far as to be tempted to impute planned design to the geological, some people do, or to the biological, some people do. It would be easy to be seduced into freeing the biological from design only to imply that the designed was determined. Some also do that. But the systems are phasic and ascend from cold laws through living principles to calculating reflection. Let's see what types of things are here. Are they natural or are they artificial? <clears throat> Has anybody got something that looks like a long face? Uh, a white stone I'm thinking of. Ah, yes. Is that natural or is it artificial? It's hard to say, but I think maybe it's natural even though it looks pretty. You think maybe it's natural, but it looks like something? Well, biological. I don't yes. Know. I don't know. No. Who, what, is this natural or artificial? Natural, good. This is natural. It was picked up by somebody who gave it to me who thought it was an artifact. And you see these things in the lunatic fringe books of archaeology. That's one back. There's a stone with a hole in it somewhere. Who's got a stone with a hole in it? Ah, oh, you also. That's very clever. You had both of them. <laughs> you could put them together to make some kind of crude symbolism, I think. <clears throat> Because we're always, as humans, projecting out onto things and seeing patterns, but the, onto the ontogeny of the pattern is crucial. Deliberate, accidental, senselessly formed, fondly manufactured. There's some rocks and fossils. Who's got fossils? Let's collect in the fossils now. You can pass fossils to people with baskets or to me if you have fossils. I think they're quite clear. I wonder, could people hold up something that's been naturally polished and something that's been culturally polished? Who has something culturally polished? There should be some Labradorite. It's blue. No. That's naturally polished. That's, that's naturally polished. Ah, yes, blue Labradorite. And naturally polished. Can we pass that one forward? I'll just put that in there. Just collect them in as many as you can. We'll just collect these in. If you could pass them all to people with baskets, so I have them at the front. There are some ores here as well. Who's holding some malachite? There should be some malachite. Somebody has some malachite. I have some malachite. There's another piece of ore that if you were a Bronze Age person, you would need to know that this contains copper. This comes from a, a prehistoric copper mine that I discovered a few weeks ago. We didn't know it was there. Who's got the other piece of this? Yes, thank you. This needs heating to make it metamorphose to bring Conductible copper out of it. Volcanic rock. There are two pieces of volcanic rock. Did anybody see this piece here? Does anybody know what this piece is? I don't know whether we can see that. Very, very smooth. This is from Great Langdale in Cumbria. This is volcanic greenstone. Is it an artifact? Yes, who think, hands up, who thinks this is a natural object? Hands up, who thinks it's an artifact? I think I'll give the points over there. It's, it's debitage, it it's, has a bulb of percussion, it's been deliberately hit, but not to, to, to actually clean up the core to make the artifact from. So this is a residue from an industrial production from about 5,000 years ago to make a, a Neolithic greenstone axe. And this is the piece left behind, but that's been modified. There's some more volcanic rock out there. Who, who else has something volcanic? Has it been collected in? Something black and small. 
Ah, yeah, could, could I have that, Louise? Thank you. If we can get a close up of this. Whether we can see this. This is around about 9,000 years old when it was modified. Does anybody know what this is? Is this an artifact? Yes, who, hands up, who thinks this is an artifact? The, and who thinks this is natural? The patterning on this is fairly clear to an archaeologist. This is part of a knife made at Çatalhöyük in Turkey by the first farmers in, in Anatolia. It's obsidian, it's black obsidian from a volcano. It makes an extraordinarily sharp blade and it's been struck in a long length by a real expert. I need some flint. Have we got some flint? Can we bring the boxes and put the boxes at the front? Have we collected everything? I need to count 43 things. Some flint. Who thinks this is natural? And who thinks this is cultural? And who thinks it might be both? <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Cued in. This is floor stone. This is flint from the base of Greenwell's pit at Graham's Graves in East Anglia. And again, it's been left. The piece isn't good enough to make something from it. But this is now a blank. Anybody who tells their boyfriend that he's a bit of a Neanderthal, he needs to... That's actually a compliment because the Neanderthals in East Anglia 65,000 years ago were taking pieces of floor stone, they were breaking it into pieces like that, and then they were making this. And they were killing and eating mammoths with them. And that, that is, that's now a replica made by a flint napper, and it's not as good. It's not as good as Neanderthals made. It's very hard to make them as good as they made because we don't do it enough. They were like Chopin making flint tools, like Chopin played piano. Quite extraordinary. And if we go back another 435,000 years, these are being made by early Homo at Boxgrove. These are half million year old so-called hand axes. So the patterning on these is cultural. So we've assembled the stones again and I need to just count them in. There should be some, there's another beautiful bladelet here. This is a Bulgarian honey colored flint. This is a, a Bronze Age knife. Even after the age of metals, people were still making this technology. They're all artifacts now through collection and redistribution and return, but most of all by handling. So as each one of these has passed through your hands, you've been changed. I think Aristotle would understand that, Armand would understand that if he's here. None of you will ever touch stone in the same way again because you can't undo this part of your history today. But all of these stones will preserve their very slow patterns after every one of us has died. But the organization that we leave upon them, their recombination, their metamorphosis, the curation, and transformation is what guarantees our future because it's in these stones that our intelligence began. These are the beginnings of the whole technology that you see by which you're now looking and sitting and sheltered and warm and comfortable and intellectual and not reduced to smashing up mammoths this morning but able to have all of those things laid on for you through the technological adventure that began with these. So in these stones, our intelligence began. 
and our, our intelligence is actually unified with these things. We're not really, we're, we're the first creature, in my opinion, to be beyond the biological. We are hypermaterial. We are an extension into these things. This is actually humanity. It is actually human. It's as human as I am. And I am made from my glasses to my shoes to my computer to my words. I'm made of artifacts. And that is the realm of artificials. And it's a different world to the Darwinian world. I think it represents a phasic shift. It has different rules. It can't be reduced to that world. And so, finally, I would just say, from these stones, our intelligence began, and from these stones, it proceeds. Thank you.